Well, good morning, friends. I hope you're having a good weekend. Uh, well, we're in week two of our series, Wherever the River Goes. And I actually have been enjoying folks that have come up to me and shared like their own fascination with rivers and waterways and just interesting facts. Um, when I think about it, some of the things that excite me is when someone shares you know, what rivers represent to them, what they make them feel, memories around ocean experiences or going to like the Great Lakes. Um, it's, it's just a beautiful thing. There's just a lot of meaning in rivers and waterways for a lot of people. And this week, we're going to talk about something that I think is really um, powerful, and that's the power of simply being, the power of being present. So that's what we're going to talk about. Last week, we talked about the choice to fight the currents, you know, of our proverbial rivers, you know, that are bending and twisting. We have the choice to fight the currents, or we could become adept navigators, adapting and harnessing the energy of the currents. So like I said this week, let's talk about the gift of being present. And I was talking to a friend this week, and he's reading a book about how we store trauma in our bodies. And interestingly, the small group that uh, the Tamashics have at their house, we're talking about a, a very similar uh, conversation last week as well. So it was like a convergence of the same topic. So storing trauma in our bodies. So this is something I hadn't really heard language to put to it, but essentially, you know, trauma isn't really just about the experience, but it's how we deal with the experience. So trauma has a lot more to do with the support we got after the experience than it does the experience itself. Did we get emotional support? Did we get spiritual help, physical support, whatever it may be? Um, or we, did we not? So if we didn't, we tend to not deal with that experience in the present, and it lingers, it festers, and it becomes something that can kind of control your life, make it hard to be present. That's what trauma does. However, my friend was reading about, just recently, this last week, about wild animals and extensive studies that have been done to find out, do wild animals store trauma in their bodies? And the conclusion was, they don't. Why? Well, one of the primary reasons why animals don't store trauma in their bodies, they don't have the cognitive ability to think themselves out of staying present. They don't have the cognitive ability to worry about the future or to dwell on the past. <laughs> so in a way, they have this involuntary gift of just simply being. You know, don't you wish you could have that? <laughs> just, I just am. And just being fully present, fully engaged in whatever is happening right now. Fish just do fish things. Birds just do bird things. They just do. You know, they don't worry about, hmm, well, if I do this, am I going to... You know, they're not reasoning through that. I wish I had that, but that's just not how human beings work. I love this quote, and truth is truth. And the, the Dalai Lama once said this. This is I have to read it twice. There are only two days in the year when nothing can be done. One is called yesterday and the other is called today, tomorrow. So let me read that again because I messed it up. There are only two days in the year where nothing can be done. One is called yesterday and the other is called tomorrow. Isn't that so good? So my conclusion to that is today is a really good day to live. It's the only day where anything can be done. In the New Testament Gospels, Jesus spent a great deal of time talking about this very conversation, this same lesson. Jesus was constantly talking about being present, just being aware of what's happening right now. And so I want to read in Matthew 6, starting with verse 25. So Matthew 6. 25. And the title of this passage is Do Not Worry. He says this, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat 
or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear? Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? First of all, when I read that passage, I think of that very first word in verse 25, which is therefore. And if you remember, like anytime you see the therefore, it's there for a reason. And whatever's coming next is probably very important. So, it's going to be important, yet we kind of need to know the context of why Jesus shared that. Because I started this passage with therefore, and here's Jesus' lesson, essentially. But you can get the context of what Jesus is sharing with one verse, the very immediate verse preceding verse 25, which is 24. And it says this, No one can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. And then Jesus goes into verse 25, Therefore, don't worry. So I asked this question, which evoked a very strong response in the first service. How much of our lives are spent worrying about money? How much of our lives are spent worrying about money? In year four of our marriage, Chrissy and I were struggling to get by. You know, when you start off, I don't know if this happened for you, but because we're both working, we were okay. And we were spending 25 bucks a week on groceries, you know, but when Chrissy uh, decided to stay home, we just had our first child in year four, it got really difficult. And we were making decisions like, do we pay the bill or do we pay the mortgage? Like this bill or the mortgage? And the mortgage would win out. I mean, that's where we were at at that point in year four. And I can only speak for myself, but I remember how hard it was to be present in those early days with Alina, our first daughter, because we were, I was so worried about money and how we were going to pay the bills by the end of the month. And it was kind of stealing away parts of my present, you know, parts of that time that you have to enjoy this new baby. So I remember a certain point where we had kind of reached the end of our financial rope and a close family member called us and said, I just got a bonus and I just want to give you guys part of it. They didn't know we were struggling at all financially. And that came as such a relief, you know, when something unexpectedly comes and it, that pit in my stomach went away, at least for a month. (laughs) But you know, that relief, it's like, a financial relief for sure, very physical and tangible, but also an emotional relief. Like, okay, I can breathe for a little bit. I, do, I don't have to think about this right now. And I was able to be more fully present. But one thing I thought about, what if I had just trusted from the beginning that we were going to be taken care of? Did I miss out on some really rich parts of those early days with Alina just because I was so worried about money? and whether we were going to be taken care of. What if I would just trusted it's going to be okay? You know, we were worried about losing our house. We were worried, and I didn't even know where that would go. I don't know what the worst case scenario would have been had we lost our house. So that's what I was worried about. We lose our house. What are we going to do? Are we going to even be able to afford to live anywhere? Or am I going to have to move in with my parents after being, you know, married for four years? There are all these questions. And as I was talking this week with a group, someone said this, nothing good has ever been fueled by worry. It's like, oof, that is good stuff. Nothing good has ever been fueled by worry. The greatest accomplishments you can think of in your own life and throughout the world history, nothing good is ever fueled by worry. So what's the point? What is the point? And I... I, realize it might be important to share something because this message that Jesus was teaching wasn't creating a formula, a logical formula to keep people from worrying. It was really about an act of trust because there is no guarantee. It's not like if you trust that you're not going to lose your house, well, then you're not going to lose your house. Sometimes you lose your house. And guess what? I was worried about losing our house 
And I thought it would be like we would be failing at life. That would just be a, ugh, you lose your house, that just, I'm a failure. You know, and guess what? We, end up, we ended up losing our house. Yeah, in year five, I think it was, of our marriage. We had to sell our house for less than we bought it for. We lost money. Um, and I look back at that now, and I think, wow, we are still here. <laughs> All those worst-case scenarios where I thought I was just going to, like, get lost in this failure of my life didn't happen. We're here. We're here, we're still kicking, and God is still providing. And all that worry did was steal my ability to stay present. That's all it did. And Jesus says this in verse 27, and which of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? I would venture to guess it actually takes away hours of our lives by worrying. So Jesus asked that rhetorical question. Can you add a single hour to the span of your life? And why do you worry about clothing, he says? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't toil, they don't spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of those lilies. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? You have little faith. If anything, I have to admit that this is simply an act of trust. If it was a guarantee, if it was a guarantee that we would, that we would never lose our house or we would never, the things we worried about would never happen, there would be no need for faith. There would be no need for trust. But just like we talked about last week with the book of Ezekiel, if we can trust that wherever the proverbial river goes, there will eventually be life at the end. If we can trust that, oh man, how much more present will we, day, will we be every day? This isn't a perfectly logical formula. Jesus' lesson is about faith and trust. And he paints this beautiful picture of the lilies. And I think he does that to help us shift our thinking. Because we think these, I think these types of things, uh, how am I going to make it through the rest of the year? Well, how am I going to pay this medical bill? What if I don't get a promotion? And other things like, what if this happens? What if this doesn't happen? Instead of spiraling these thoughts, Jesus asks us to consider a different way of thinking, a different way of living, because how we think directly impacts how we live. And I don't even have to explain that, because we all know it. How we think directly impacts how we live. So instead of cycling paralyzing thoughts and fears, thinking things like, hey God, remember when we were struggling and we thought we were going to lose it all and we did and yet we're okay. <laughs> and yet we're okay today. Remember how you provided for us and someone gave us an unexpected gift? Remember how we didn't have much? And yet we, we realized that relationships were so much more important than stuff. A different way of thinking. And then finally, as Jesus shared, painted that picture of the lilies, if, God, if you can take care of the smallest living things, maybe even seem trivial at times, if you can take care of the smallest living things, I want to trust that you can take care of me. And that's a trust. That is trust all the way. It is not a formula. This is not a prosperity thing. If you th think this, you're going to get this. No, it is just simply trusting that wherever the Spirit of God goes, there is going to be life. And I'm going to follow that way. Because we're human beings and we are inevitably going to worry about the future. Yet, if we are thinking primarily about what could be or what isn't, we might forget to live in the goodness of what already is right now. So if we are thinking primarily about the future, <laughs> worrying about the future, we might forget to live in what already is right now, today, in the present. So let's finish this up by reading the final four verses of the passage. And this is verse 31, and it says, Therefore, do not worry, saying, what will we eat or what will we drink? Or what will we wear? 
For it is the Gentiles who seek all those things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need those things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things will be given to you as well. And that seek first the kingdom of God, I think that parallels perfectly with this idea of wherever the river goes. Wherever the Spirit of God is leading, all these things will be given to you, especially peace of mind that God is going to take care of us. And finally, Jesus says, so don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. Now that's honest. (laughs) Today's trouble is enough for today. So I think today is a good day to live. Amen. Let's pray. God, I am so thankful that you've given us all these incredible teachings that Jesus uh, preached throughout his time on earth so that we could actually have an example of what it's like to live in the present. God, and when we're worried, when we're cycling those fears, those worries, when it feels like too much, God, remind us of the lilies. Remind remind us of the birds of the air. Remind us of the fish that just are. That don't even have the capacity to worry about the future or dwell on the past. Remind us that you even take care of them. So surely, maybe we can have this hope that you will take care of us as well. In your heavenly name, amen.